two, three. Cause I'm a dig deep, I'm a stand tall, I got the grit of the underdog. I'm stronger than you think, I can do this on my own. There's a difference between loneliness and doing this alone. Welcome everybody and uh, you know this is I don't even know what episode we're up to at the moment but you're back for another episode of DC Music Rocks podcast presented by the Capital Groove Collective elevating the sounds voices and music of the DMV that is DC Maryland and Virginia uh, to the world stage one conversation and one song at a time here we are paving the way in the Washingtonian uh, metropolitan area through diversity of genre gender, identity, and community. Today, I'm really blessed to be talking with the wonderful Gracious Me, all the way from the DMV, uh, about her career here in the DC metropolitan area, and you know what makes her music special, what makes the area so special, and how you can get involved with supporting the DMV music uh, scene. So how are you? What's going on? I'm great. So I have, um, I put out an album. Um, Let's see, it's called True to Life. Oh, I and love I, um, I did this one, um, I actually recorded it in 2019 and then it was supposed to come out in earlier 2020. And so that was a bit slowed by the pandemic. But um, when it eventually, we, we did make the decision to, to get it out and it did really amazingly well. I had no idea how releasing in a pandemic was gonna go, but um, it made it to number 10 on the Roots Music Report Contemporary Folk Chart. And some of the individual songs have been doing really well on some charts as well. And that's just really been amazing. Awesome. So for those who don't know who you are, you're, you know, you're a contemporary folk artist, obviously. Um, sure. Can you tell me more about like what, like, are you from DC? What made you uh, start doing music here? Where, like, what's your story? Sure, so I'm originally from Mississippi. And I have sort of wended my way to, um, to the Virginia side here. And um, just when I got here and sort of got settled, I wanted to start doing expressive things, art things again, but I knew that I just didn't have space in my life for sort of some of the larger group organized things that I might've participated in in the past, musical theater or choirs. I just wasn't going to be able to show up for extended periods, you know, for, for, for practices on, on somebody else's schedule all the time. And so I really sort of looked at my life and where I could fit doing something artistic into it. And songwriting really seemed like something that I could do on my own schedule and then sort of build out from songwriting to then performing. And this, is, this has been a lovely community to, to sort of do that kind of growth in. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand. However, I feel like, you know, from a, from an outsider's perspective, uh, you know, mu music in Mississippi, uh, you, you come, you grew up in a very, uh, you know, soulful area where music really resonates throughout the state. And a lot of people, I think, look at the DC area and think it's all politics, 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 uh, even though we are still technically in the South. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what was, what was the main uh, decision, the, the main reason behind your decision to move to DC to become a songwriter? Right, so, so you know, I, I work here and I, I tell people when I go to sort of songwriter conventions and stuff in other places that you kind of, you, you can't, you know, you can't turn around in, in DC without running into the kind of people who just as, as a hobby or as a side project do music making or, or do songwriting. There's so many people in this area who, you know, have full-time jobs doing other things, have full careers, and make the choice to fit music into their lives. And those are really fun people to make music with, you know, because there's not as much of a sort of, you have to earn the right to play with me, sort of. Um, right. You know, th these are other people who are, who are choosing the joy of making music um, as, as, a, as a passion project. And so I've really enjoyed getting to know a lot of those people in this area. And they've been so gracious with me in playing with me and, you know, giving me feedback on songs and, um, you know, lining up, you know, gigs and opportunities with me. So the community here is really, um, you know, a, a good one to invest in. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a very, 
you, you, you put it on the nose, like there's so much going on around here and such a diverse range of, of styles and um, ethnicities and things that, uh, that the DC music scene, you know, offers. Is, do, what else do you think makes the DMV scene so special, so unique compared to other states? Well, it, it, it may be that there are certainly a lot of influences here because it seems like there's almost nobody here who's from here. Right. And so, um, you know, they're definitely, they're indigenous DC music scenes like Go-Go and that sort of thing. But so many of the people who make music in this area grew up somewhere else, were influenced by, you know, the, the music landscape somewhere else and sort of bring all those influences here and so it's really sort of fun when you start talking influences or um you know just sort of the music somebody listened to when they were a teenager if you run into intersections sometimes that's sort of more surprising than not running into intersections because your your backgrounds are so different yeah no absolutely do you think that the dc music scene receives enough credibility well, you know, I definitely think it's really, really difficult to live here and be a full-time musician. Those of you who are who are making that work, you know, all We're power crazy. to you because <laughs> it's just this is a really expensive area to live, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, just on that basis alone, it can be very difficult to build a music career here. Sort of the reverse of like, sort of, uh, there's an arts reawakening in, say, Detroit because it's become such a cheap place to live that arts people who want to do sort of a part-time job and make art full-time can find a way to make, you know, making a living work there. And so, you know, I definitely think that some people may look at kind of DC music as mostly being sort of a, a part-time thing or a passion project thing. Mm -hmm. And so those who are here and are really, you know, gigging full time and doing things like you do, planning, you know, international tours and things. Um, you know, the the kind of people that you're looking to, you know, book with and that kind of thing may not hear of that many other folks from DC doing that kind of thing. For sure, for sure. That's yeah, no, that's a valid point as well. You're bringing out all the guns today. I love it. <laughs> do you? Um, so. In relation to that, what do you think uh, the music scene here? Are there any? What, what would be a major shift that you would like to see here to bring? I don't know to amplify the music scene for DC. Like, is there anything that you think we could be doing on a, on a local government level or on a music community level to help make things easier for the artist or make uh, the artistic community of DC more prevalent? Sure. Um, you know, it's quite possible that there could be more kind of music exploration support, I guess. I think um, because perhaps some of the, you know, parks department and things here that do sponsor, you know, music in the parks and that kind of thing, they may, they may have enough money to have surefire hits come every time they do a monthly concert. You know, it's like... Right. Hmm, should we have the seldom seen come or should we have this person nobody's ever heard of? And right. because they have the resources to pay some famous folks sometimes, they may, you know, oh, you know, our constituents will be happy if we make a known quantity available. Um, and so, you know, th that may be kind of a, a balancing act that some of the, you know, regional entities that support the arts may have to sort of wade through is, you know, how can they support up and comers who are indigenous to this area when, you know, I'm sure just like concert arenas, right? It's really easy to book the Rolling Stones, right? Mm. It's really easy to book, you know, Jimmy Buffett or somebody, right. um, you know, and, and probably a little bit more of a, of a gamble, um, you know, to book the War and Treaty or to book, you know, somebody who is, doing great work and doing amazing things, um, but just the people who only listen to sort of top 40 or oldies radio may not know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All valid points. We're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, we're gonna find out more about who Gracious Me is. <laughs> 
Welcome back, everybody, to the DC Music Rocks podcast presented by the Capital Groove Collective. My name is Emma G. I'm a singer, songwriter, author of My Life, My Songs, My Healing, and of course, the founder of the Capital Groove Collective, which was created to, you know, bring the diversity of the DMV music scene to the world stage, one conversation at a time. Today, I'm talking with Gracious Me, all the way from the DMV, obviously. Uh, and I, I want to I talk more about this album of yours. Um, you released it, you know, you recorded it last year in 2009 not last year anymore, we're in 2021. Uh, you recorded it uh, in 2019 and of course released it coming up to the pandemic. Um, tell me how your experiences have been around what it means to be an artist in a pandemic. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, definitely the, the rollout of this album is very different than I had anticipated. Um, for March of 2020, um, I was anticipating releasing the album at the end of March. Okay. And um, I had, for the first time ever, I had four gigs in four different states scheduled for March. And obviously, yeah. if you're in the DMV, you can have three gigs within an hour, but they're technically in different states. But I'm still going to claim that, right? Word. But, um, but then I was also going to New Jersey. So, um, you know, and I had really worked hard on, um, you know, putting together contacts and reaching out to people, really growing the the reach of, you know, who I played for and who I played with and had really been doing, you know, building out of that sort of thing. And then, you know, I got the very first thing that I did in March. I managed to get that done. And then everything else just disappeared. And, um, you know, there are a lot of music who you know sort of immediately switch to various live streaming formats and um and I've done some of that but I'm really not a solo artist and so I pretty much always perform as a duo or a full band of some sort right. and um you know and so I definitely had some of the lovely folks who, who do play with me do a few kind of duo performances streaming um you know particularly over the summer when the weather was nice and that sort of thing um but i'm i'm not the kind of person who's going to set up a weekly live stream right. um and and get my music out that way and so um you know it, it it was really interesting for me this was the first time that i have used a promoter to um pursue radio play for my music and if i hadn't done the work to set that up you know in the fall and winter of 2019 you know, it's quite possible that nobody would have heard my music. Right. Um, and so, because, you know, it's easy to just sort of throw your stuff out there on Spotify and Amazon Music and whoever and get, you know, three streams. Right. So, um, you know, it it's always interesting how things kind of fall into place. You know, I, I had sort of gone back and forth about whether to do the promotion route, um, but I certainly got a lot of, you know, support and a lot of listens out of this album that I wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and so that's been really fun as something that I can just take the finished product of the album and have people be able to, to, to listen to that um, mm -hmm. because I've, you know, had people listening on the radio. And so that's been, you know, certainly gratifying for me, um, you know, sometimes you wonder if, if people that you know, who hear your music and say they like it, um, you know, if they're doing that because they like you as a person. But if somebody who's never met you before listens to your music and says, hey, I'm going to play this on my show, they hear a lot of music. They get mm. piles of releases every week. And if they choose to play yours, it's because they actually just liked it. Yeah. And so that's, you know, I mean, that's, for an artist, that's amazing. Just for somebody to hear your music and say, hey, I actually like this. I got something out of this music is it's just a gift every time absolutely what is the reason like what is your why and what i mean by that is like a lot of a lot of artists you know or want to be artists or you know people in the beginning of their stages and i realize that you've been doing this for a while now but a lot of people when they start out they they you know people think that they just want to be a rock star or they want to be famous or they want to be the next taylor swift or whatever um for, for myself, a lot of the reason why I do 
music is because I want to save the world one song at a time, right? <laughs> uh, and I think that's a, a lot of what a lot of DMV artists are about, is about making an impact, making a positive change with the messages and the music. Um, what is the purpose behind Gracious Me's why? Sure. So, you know, I, I think like a lot of people, I just like the creative expression of songwriting. Um, it's, you know, it, it's certainly a lot more purposeful than some other hobbies you could have. You have a finished product at the end. Sure. Um, uh, you know, streaming is fun, but there's only so much Netflix you can watch. And, um, you know, it's, I think it's pretty amazing to have, you know, a, a passion project that I pursue that has finished products that come out the end. And then when I, you know, do get into recording studio and get them recorded, it's it seems like it's sort of miraculous every time that, you know, my music can exist in places where I am not. You know, I understand that that's been a thing for, you know, over 100 years now that people can hear your recorded music. But it's still it's a pretty amazing thing that, that people can hear your ideas, that people can, you know, can experience the, the thoughts and the feeling that you have. Um, on their own. And anytime that anybody, you know, gives me feedback that they heard one of my songs and connected with it, then I know I've accomplished what I was trying to do as a songwriter, you know, and I have a song, um, it was actually on this album. Um, it's called The Battle's Not Over. And it, it talks about, um, uh, you know, folks who've been in the military and then are suffering with PTSD. And the first time I ever played that, I was at the Epicure Cafe over in Fairfax, Virginia. And um, there was somebody else who was in the lineup that evening who had brought a good sized table full of friends to, to, to come. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times when that happens, sort of the, the table full of friends just turn their backs to the stage and talk to each other until their person comes up, you know? Right. So if you manage to, if you manage to get through to those folks, you've accomplished something, you know? But um, these folks who were sitting right up at the front, it was, it was a couple. And as I came off the stage after I finished my set, the, the lady of the couple grabbed my arm and she said, that's how it is. And I was like, wow, okay, you know, thanks. But then I sort of had to get out of the way. But then at a break, they came over and talked to me and the husband of the couple had been in Vietnam and they both really expressed that they thought that my song had really sort of hit a nerve with them about how you have to sort of reassemble your life after you've experienced something traumatic like that. Mm. And, and you have to sort of work through who you're going to be while incorporating those experiences, you know? And, and that's the most that you can ever do with any kind of art. If you can reach somebody who's had an experience that you personally haven't had, and they say that feels right, then, then that's all you can ever hope to accomplish. You know, it's wonderful if, you know, if a song charts somewhere or if it clearly is speaking to a lot of people, but, you know, I think that's kind of the, maybe the hardest test is if it's something that isn't your personal experience, but you have, have been able to convey it. And so that's actually the, um, the title of my album is called True to Life because there's a songwriting saying that songs have to be true to life, but they don't necessarily have to be true to your life, right? If you have enough drama to be churning out, you know, a song a week, maybe you should tone it down on the drama a little bit, you know. Um, but, um, but, you know, if you can sort of think about the common experience, if you can think about things that lots of people are going through and write something that, that lets folks know they're not alone, that connects people, that's, that's an amazing thing to accomplish. And that's really my why for why I create music. I love that why. I think that is so powerful. And, you know, you're, you're talking about, you're, you seem to have a lot of lo lengthy uh, <laughs> titled songs, but one of yeah. the, I think your re most recent release, didn't be uh, Don't Become What You Claim to Hate. Yes. You know, that's another powerful message of, you know, almost uh, creating your own fate. If you think negatively, you're going to be a negative person. If you're going to, you want to think positively, you know, think positive thoughts. Can you tell me more about Don't Become What You Claim to Hate? Sure. So that's all. I wrote it, I think maybe later 2018 or 2019, but it's a very of the moment song. And so that's why that's, that's why that's the one that I sent to you. 
Because what it's talking about is that, you know, a lot of us see things in the world that we think, you know, aren't right and that we want to, to set right and we want to pursue different ways of achieving a better world, but that it's really important that we make sure that we're motivated positively in pursuing positive change, that if you are motivated by, you know, hatred and fear to try to change things, then then you're just going to become the things that you claim are so awful about the world that you need to fix them. Um, and this song was one that for me was one of the most fun to record because this is sort of a, you know, I kind of write with just a guitar and I'm sort of a three chords in the truth kind of writer. But in the studio, this song has turned into this kind of muscle shoalsy sort of Gosh. soulful feeling Love song, it. which is just, I mean, you know, it's amazing the magic that other instrumentalists can bring to sort of the bones of what you've written. If you give people the space to do that, you know? Amen. Yeah. And so I, I think sometimes if, if you know too much about music, Maybe if you are sort of overproducing, you may kind of keep other people limited a little bit. You know, it's kind of like if you bring in a harpist and all you want them to do is one of those sort of angel glissando things, right? <laughs> They're like, you know, I can do a lot more than just that one thing, right? right, right. But if that's your concept of what you want out of a harp, that may be all you get, you know? Right. But I definitely try to bring in people who are great at what they do show them the bones of what I have and get out of their way. And I get the most amazing things out of people. And it's just such, such a fun process to, to, to build up a song. This song has got some really fun kind of, you know, soul piano in it. And um, I really pushed the guitarist who is not really sort of a, a soul guitarist kind of guy in that direction as well. And I'm just so proud of the production on this one. I love that. I, I, and I, I think you're 100% right. We, we have this tendency to sort of think very linear uh, when, when it's just us as solo artists, that we right. forget that everybody has their own super, superpowers, right? Um, right? And being able to sort of give them the space to breathe and create and flourish. And you just never know what kind of magic you can create as a result. I love that. Sure, sure. So on that note, quite literally, but a bunch. Uh, <laughs> let's have a listen to uh, Don't Become What You Claim to Hate from Gracious Me. All right, and we're back. Thank you so much, uh, Gracious Me. That was gorgeous song. I'm super pumped um, to hear the feedback from your audience and our audience as, you know, the messages of your music resonate throughout not only the DMV, but also, you know, the world and the country, uh, especially at the moment, given the political climate going through uh, the world at the moment. I want to sort of mash things up a little bit now. We're going to go into what we call the bullet question round, uh, where I'm just going to say, like, ask you some really freaking random stuff. Um, and you are going to, you know, rapid fire answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Have you had your coffee? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> okay, cool. Question number one, what do you think you're much better at than you usually are or than you actually are? Sorry. Trivia. Ah, okay. What kidneys, uh, should kidneys be able to be bought and sold? No. What's the most creative use of emojis you've ever seen? Ooh, as a song title. Oh, nice. Uh, when was the last time you got to tell someone, I told you so? Oof. Yesterday. <laughs> what riddles do you know? Riddles. Well, it's black and white and red all over. A newspaper. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may have been having, I'm, I'm in uh, Chesapeake Beach at the moment, and uh, I had this elderly gentleman in a electric green wheelchair roll up to me and my friend this morning over coffee, and he told us three riddles as well. So I actually heard that one literally three hours ago. <laughs> I love that. Uh, what's your cure for hiccups? Stare really deeply into someone's eyes. Ooh, I love that. What invention doesn't get a lot of love but has greatly improved the world? Oof. Air conditioning. 
Amen. What's the most interesting building you've ever seen or been in? Most interesting building. There is in Eastern Germany, I think it's near Leipzig, this, um, I think it's called like the Folks Monument, but it sort of looks like the Mines of Moria in The Lord of the Rings. Oh, nice. Which was fun fact, uh, filmed in New Zealand where I'm from. So there we go. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Indeed, indeed. Uh, what's, uh, sorry, what mythical creature do you wish actually existed? Hmm. Dragons. Nice. What are your most important rules when going on a date? Most important rules when going on a date. Um, let's see. Uh, go on a date where there's something to do. And if they don't ask questions about you within the first, you know, few sentences of what they say, that's a big red flag. Word. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> If someone narrated your life, who would you want to be the narrator? Wait, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Sorry, if someone narrated your life, who would you ah. want to be the narrator? Ooh, Lucinda Williams. Nice. What was the most unsettling film you've ever seen? Oh, goodness. The most unsettling film? Yes. Requiem for a dream. Oh, it's oh. like being stabbed in the face with a screwdriver. Yes. I, I, yep, I, I'm right there with you. Uh, if you were given a PhD, a PhD degree, but had no more knowledge of the subject of the degree besides what you have now, what degree would you want to be given to you? Ooh. Hmm. Uh, Southern Studies. What's something people don't worry about, but really should? Um, don't worry about, but should. Um, wow, that's a tough one. Whether they have their capo in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the children born today will have a better or worse lives than the parents? Gosh, um, I, I think it depends on what the current parents accomplish in the world, maybe. But I would say that the, probably we are we are having some growing pains of trying to make a better world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what charity or charitable cause is most deserving of money? Wow. So yeah, at the end of the year, I was I was looking for some folks, and I decided to contribute to um, Feeding America because their, um, you know, their food programs all sort of buy wholesale. And so they kind of get a huge bang for the buck that you give them. Nice, I, I, I love that. If magic was real, what spell would you try to learn first? Ooh, a spell to play any instrument. I love it, I love it. <laughs> what goal do you think humanity is not focused enough on achieving? Hmm. A goal humanity is not focused enough on achieving. Um, I was reading about a country, and I'm actually blanking on which one it is now, that maintains a happiness index. And I think sort of well-being of people is would be something positive to, to track. I love that. I think, yeah, there's a World Happiness Report, I believe it's called. Uh, it covers yeah, okay. other countries. Um, I don't know where, but no, that, that I've, I've remember reading it and thinking Scandinavia is definitely up there uh, on the list, <laughs> and uh, New Zealand, obviously, and Australia. Uh, I think right, America, right, you do pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've heard rumors. I've heard rumors. We do okay. <laughs> Happiness is definitely one of those things that we try to aim for. You know, equity and everything. Uh, and the lucky last random question is: How can we follow you, or fo you know? stay in touch with Gracious Me. Sure. So my website is graciousmemusic.com. And then on all of the social media, I'm not on TikTok, but um, most all of the other ones, I'm just at Gracious Me Music. 
Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much for, for joining me today and for sharing your light, your wisdom and your magic with the, you know, the Capital Groove Collective audience, the DC Music Rocks audience. Uh, of course, this is today's podcast where I, Emma G, had the opportunity to speak with Gracious May. You please follow her and keep up to date with everything, including her brilliant new album, which was released at the beginning of last year. Um, you know, indie musicians really rely on the support that you, the audience, give them. Uh, so please make sure you show up and, and brag about how wonderful and diverse the community here is. Again, you can follow Capital Groove Collective, Capital Groove DC, and DC Music Rocks at DC Music Rocks on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. To find out more about our guests, news, initiatives, or applying to be featured on our podcast, head on over to our website, the www.capital with an o groovecollective.com that's capital groove collective.com again my name is emma g be good be kind spread love like it's going out of fashion be your own kind of superhero and don't forget to celebrate 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 every so much easier than doing the work that makes us human it's a piece of cake Drawing lines that don't break That box them out and box us in Don't become what you claim to hate Don't be the reason another heart breaks Get in there and work for every change you can What you claim to hate Changing what you can't accept So much harder than getting upset In for the long haul Getting up when you fall We so often get what we reflect Become what you claim to hate Don't be the reason Another heart breaks Get in there and work for every Change you can make But don't become what you claim to hate Cause I'm a dig deep, I'm a stand tall, I got the grit of the young.